All right, here we go. <clears throat> hey, how's it going, everybody? Good evening, and welcome to the Two Degrees Podcast, brought to you by the Play On Foundation. It's your boy, Javi, and here we have a wonderful guest, and I can't wait to dive into these questions because, in my opinion, he was he was the person that everybody was like, oh, man, that's that's him. That's... That's that's Degrassi. That's that's royalty oh. from. <laughs> so everybody, Hello, welcome Raymond of Black. How you doing, Thank buddy? Thank you. I'm good, man. I'm. I mean, I guess that's a default response, man. I've been like, just. I've just been inside this apartment for. Like two weeks now. Like I really mm. haven't been out because uh, because in Ontario, especially Omicron has just ravaged us. So um, just trying to like lay low and not contribute to to you know the spread or yeah. whatever. No, that's fair. That's fair. No, so fair. then, in, but last um, not last year was it last year? No, when we were filming, you mentioned that you it was this time you, last year, if you can believe it. Like we were, oh, wow. we were doing probably doing that party scene like around this time, in that backyard. That's remember? So funny. Yeah, oh, that, yeah, like yeah, that where, backyard yeah. that <laughs> that spread across like literally the Pacific Ocean. Unreal. That amazing view that was just yeah yeah no that was, man, to have a view like that I think that would make quarantine so much easier. Just to get out and know that you have that vastness awaiting you. No, but didn't you mention, um, was it way before we were filming, but then you caught COVID as well? No, I've, I've, I've uh, fortunately never had it. Um, but it's, Oh, you're, it one, of, you're like, one of those Matrix people. Right, right. <laughs> it's just I'm dodging it left, right, and center. It might be like a, a testament to like maybe I'm just in, entitled or like uh, fortunate or something where I, where I'm able to like seclude myself in a way because um, because all of all of exactly. the pandemic when we were you know last year when we were doing it we were in that hotel so like I and and I you know no one ever told us that oh we couldn't that's the that's the quarantine I was I was referring to then I guess where it was like you were forced to be in that yeah. Room. Like I mean, no one, no one explicitly Where, said to us, "Hey, you can't go outside." But I, it felt yeah. like this is a dream opportunity. You don't want to mess this up. You've been given this like hotel room to stay in for months on end. Okay, like I, I don't have any yeah. reason to be even in this province, so I might as well just yeah. be as strict as I can with myself. And so I didn't get it during yeah. that time. It went away. It seemed like in the summer, and now it's back. And thus far, knock on wood, haven't gotten it. Yeah. Fair. No, that's that's fair. So then, how has that been then? Just like trying, how's your mental? What's going on there? Because to coop yourself up in a place for that long can drive you a little bit insane. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I think we've all done all the different things, like bust out the old PS2, uh, play those nostalgic video games from my high school years. Um, I've done all that stuff. Today, I tried to do a, a an at home workout. It was nonsense. Like it just, <laughs> what am I doing here? Yeah, I'm tired, but like this didn't do anything. Um, it, uh, yeah, mental is not. It's it's fine. Like I I can't complain about anything, but like I can feel everyone around me. My mom's a nurse. Like she, I can just tell she's like flustered and like exhausted because you know she's having to like cobble together a staff from from so many different floors. They're testing people, then they've got to send nurses home because people are testing positive, asymptomatic, but they're sending people home, la la la. They have like a different rules because I think nurses are allowed to work with it or something because these hospitals need people working. It's just like, yeah, your mental is tied to like all the, the people around you who are also struggling in different ways, whether they have COVID or not. It's stuff for everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fair. So you've been cooped up there. Um, does that mean, you're not coming back next year, Ginny and Georgia? Or have you done your days? Or no. I mean, I don't know what I'm supposed to divulge, but we're shooting right now. Um, 
then we're doing okay. just like we were doing on made we were doing like the three tests a week um and then i think even if but then if you're shooting on a day or something you, you're getting extra is that testing. is that the oh. sign is that the sign for doing tests? yeah this is the, this is eating and this is testing <laughs> My nose, my sir, my nose has calluses, man. Like, like you know how people have calluses from like working out too much. Calluses all up in my nose. Yeah, that's hilarious. So okay. you're not entirely cooped up then. You're still, you're still getting out to film. Yeah, I haven't uh, since November, but because uh, and then whatever we broke for Christmas and all that stuff, um, and now we're back. And I haven't had a date on set yet, but I'm, I, that'll be in a couple weeks. So. Uh, nice. but, you know the production's That's running. Fun, Knock on so, wood, the production's running right now. Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, one of you, those good problems to have in a sense where you have you have work, but then it's you don't know when the next time you're back in is. Yeah, yo. Something I've thought about for a long time. Okay, well, first of all, let's just get out of the way that I couldn't do what you're doing. And when you were telling me about this on set and you were showing me like the graphs and like you were drawing on graph paper, like how you were going to design and make this this thing work. And I was like, mm -hmm. I don't know if he's actually going to do it. Like, is this just like a, like a, a thing he's talking about? And like, it's one of those projects that you never <laughs> finish. Oh yeah, me and my friends are going to bring back the old band and then you never do it. Um, and then you, you're doing it. I couldn't, I couldn't. I think it's cool. Well, thank you, thank you. But then when you say you couldn't, like to what degree? Because you seem like an outdoorsy type. That's just because I have a beard, but like I can't, I can't <laughs> do. <laughs> that's, that's all. You, that's, look, you play the woodsman, but. I play a so woodsman funny. real well, but if, if a spider was ever on that ax, I'm out. I quit the job. <laughs> like I can't do bugs. I really don't like being dirty. When I was a kid, man, my mom used to dunk my Oreos in the in the milk for me because I didn't want my fingers to get wet Oreo dust. On <laughs> I don't like outdoors, messy. I don't like it. So that's I mean, so like funny. I really could. Oh, fair. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. So when was the last time? Have you ever been camping? Have you like? The tent experience, not cottage. Yeah, I've done tent experience. And when I was a kid, yeah, we used to go camping a lot when I was a kid. And then I think it sort of like became clear to my parents that like, oh, he, he's not into it and he's never going to be. Um, so then, then like the only other time I went was like a, a friend of mine had a wedding in like the woods and we all stayed in tents, but I, I hated it. Like I hated being out there. That's so funny. Yeah. But you're doing it. I mean, you're you're hmm. you're housed, so you're you're not. It's not a tent. Yeah. You're you're not like woodsman in it. No, no, no. Like we we have all our amenities. Like right now, the heater is on. Um, right. As I'm as I'm talking to you, we got we got we cooked. We have a kitchen. We got a fridge. We got a freezer that's TV. stocked with food. I don't know if you could see it there, but there's a TV. Oh yeah, fifty-six inch screen TV back there, just in oh, case. That's bigger than my channel. So, <laughs> still have some amenities that I feel like are, are necessities. Have there been any like weird or or unexpected sort of um, things that have come up? Like you know, you were dreaming about this trip for a long time. Now you're doing it, and you didn't expect what? Huh. I didn't expect all the engine problems that I, I had to experience. Um, I thought the truck was in better working order. So the biggest hitch that um, we faced was there was a bolt that found its way into the engine and it completely destroyed the engine from the inside out. And we were stuck in Brunswick for three weeks. Um, and not even Frederick, we were, we were in some just place rural. called Edmondston. Okay. Yeah. And so that was like the biggest unexpected thing that happened. But we were cooped up in a day's inn that was in the middle of nowhere. And when I say it's in the middle of nowhere, it was... One taxi. There was only one taxi company. To get into town was a 15-minute drive, 15, 20-minute drive. And then... Because I also have my bike here, 
um, I took my bike into town a couple of times and that was, uh, an hour both ways, an yeah. hour one way and then an hour back. In like the woods, and like literally the nature of like yeah. an animal could get you or whatever. Yeah. A spider. Yeah. So <laughs> those, those dangerous spiders just hanging out. I'm gonna get but, touch. um, that was, I think the most, most, uh, unexpected thing of this trip was I didn't, I didn't put into consideration the amount I'd be spending on repairs. But yeah. with yeah. that How said, something like um, that? yeah, um, I'd say the other experience was my partner um, sees spirits sometimes. And so there was one time where we parked out on the side of the road, um, no cars. It seemed very, it seemed quiet enough. And then it was a pretty eerie night. And then hmm. we woke up why, what and realized we were parked why next to the cemetery. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> location wise. That's horror that, movie beginning. It's the beginning of the yeah. horror movie, right? There. Yeah, right, right there, exactly. Like if the truck didn't, if the truck chose not to start that night, you know, there, there would have been a lot more fear involved in that. Yeah, yeah. But um, other than that, going to all the different cities that we've been to has been incredible. Um, still social did, distancing. Did your partner to a see degree. anything that night? Yep, she saw two spirits that night just hanging out in the truck as if they were exploring and using the new amenities. I was like, okay, yeah. Maybe yeah, hell for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The world is, is, is and it's, 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 it's like, I don't know, being in the different locations that we've been in, there's just been different experiences mm-hmm. in regards to what's, what's, spiritually around so that's also an interesting thing but being in in the bigger cities it seems to be a little bit easier when it comes to that like we're not too we're not too woodsy um like right now we're in we're in san diego so it's it's not like we're we're do you have to pay for like do you have to pay for like parking do you have to pay for like parking Um, and stuff everywhere you go it depends it depends. So that's a, that's New Mexico, Mexico, yeah, New Mexico and Arizona was was easier where we could boondock and stuff. Texas as well. Um, and then while traveling, especially if we're in transit to other places and we don't need that much time in one place, then we just end up at a like Walmart parking lot or something. Mm-hmm. But for the long term stays, like right now, um, looking into staying in RV parks and stuff like that. Which isn't too bad, because yeah. then it's it's comparable with with paying rent. So, oh yeah, would I rather be in an apartment in Vancouver paying this price while it's terrible price. weather and right? So, it's a it's a fair trade. We're going to a place. We're mobile. We can do whatever we want. So it's it seems to be paying off in that sense. Like how how did they, how did what inspired it? Like why? I don't know anyone else who's I know people do road trips, but like you're doing mm. like, like there's potentially I mean I'm I'm talking big here, but like there's potentially you just do this forever. Like you just this is how you live. Yeah, and I, yeah. I don't know if you've seen um, Nomadland. Have you seen Nomadland? Yeah. Oh. Like I Definitely. saw that, yeah, last, that, was, that was a couple fun. months ago or whatever, and I thought of you, and I'm like, this is just like what inspired. <laughs> this is what he's doing. <laughs> why is like what like what happened? Where did it come from? Well, well I happened? also just have to give you some comfort. We do have a toilet here, so luckily we don't have to. I saw it in the drawing. No land. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, the first wave quarantine was definitely did did a lot on my mental um and I got to a point where I just needed to reconnect with myself and if I had to say that a motto to this trip was to 
reconnect with my needs versus my wants. Because I just felt like, in a way, this is almost like a self-flagellation, if you will. Because I just felt weird after, you know, door dashing and Uber eating for the fifth night in a row from a restaurant that's literally two blocks from my house. And it's like, what am I, what am I doing? I'm getting so complacent in this place that I need to, there's more out there and I'm not taking advantage of what's out there. And for me, I love traveling. And then with borders closing, it made it so much harder to do. So that on top of the fact that I had just finished Matthew McConaughey's Green Lights, where he talks about his adventures and going on the road and exploring. And I was like, I think that's the move. I think it's, it's, it's time to do something different, to shake things up in a way where it's like the same type of shake up that I did when I moved to Vancouver for the industry where yeah. I need to find myself in the unknown again. And I wow. think this trip has definitely it pushed paid me in that direction. Time. Yeah. It really so, worked for me last time. Like uh, that was another inspiring story that you told me was like, you were in Toronto, you were doing it here. And, and like even agents and stuff out here were like, like saying to you, like, no, it's not. And you were like, no, yeah. I, I can do it. I'm capable. I know I am. And I'm going to go over there and yeah. do it. And you did it. Like, that's, I feel like not all people and certainly myself, like you hear that kind of discouragement and then you, you just, from people that you're who are supposed to be working for you. No, and with you and, respectfully, you have, you have your own inspiring tale where you started at the age you did and you got over that hurdle of people associating you with that Degrassi character. Oh, he's just Degrassi. Wasn't that, you know, its own type of, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know. I think I did that show as a kid and had a great time. And I don't think I was actually all that good of an actor. I just, <laughs> um, but you, you like the reward <clears throat> didn't match like my capability, like my, my ability. Hmm. Um, so yeah. I thought like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm this. And maybe I was, I would come up with excuses like, oh, I'm pigeonholed as Degrassi or something. But really, I just wasn't good. So I was rightfully yeah. not getting work. Well, even, even in, in that phrase itself, where that is probably, you know, the, the direction of pigeonholing where it's like, you're this kid who came from this show where this show unfortunately gives kids that type of ego where they think that oh because i'm on this successful show and i've been on it for x amount of years i should have some kind of credibility to my name when in reality we we as actors especially in toronto we grow up and we're like we kind of, well let me speak for myself but i kind of hated Degrassi kids for a bit because <laughs> I was like, these kids are terrible actors, but they're getting these opportunities. What the hell am I doing? And I'm not getting shit. So it's like, I don't know. As I'm getting older, where, now, where like I'm being able like, to. As I'm getting older, I just feel like it's it's so it's such a cocktail of of ingredients that you need luck, uh, you know. Um, that right place, right time thing. A lot of fucking luck. That's the biggest thing about this industry that I learned is it's a lot of luck. Yeah. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed my time there and learned a lot. And then, and then, yeah, you do, you do, maybe you have an ego, but especially in Canada, that ego goes away very quickly because, you, <sighs> and if you stay in this industry long enough, I feel like, the other artists really temper you and like you temper or whatever what is that thing with swords where you temper your sword against iron like, and iron right right and like you yeah. you just stay in it for a long time and you get better if, if you enjoy the craft or whatever i think you just stay in it long yeah. enough and you you get your victories and you have your terrible defeats as well and but like yeah when you're younger and you start to have this this ego and i can imagine on the other side like seeing us 
punk ass kids like walking around like we own the place and we're we maybe don't even not, not deserve is not the right word but like we're not any better than anyone else and we but yet we have some success and, and other people are trying to quantify like why am i not getting there's no rhyme or reason there's no reason why one person yeah. has and one person doesn't it's just luck of the draw um but it all sort of like yeah. i don't know a lot of averages like comes out in the wash in the end if you want to if you want to stay in this field and do it which sometimes you look at it and go like why why would i continue this this is large mostly mm -hmm. a musical experience and then it's so fun for like a blip and then it's terrible again <laughs> well with that like let's let's start with there what is raymond's origin story within this industry did you always want to dive into acting when you were a kid or did somebody yeah. tell you about this audition and no i always wanted to do it um yeah i my parents so i was in like an only child for a long time till i was eight and uh, my parents just spoiled me like we would go to the theater and uh i would go like on their date nights we'd go to movies and stuff all the time so they took me to see the lion king when it first came out in toronto like on stage and uh and then like i don't know like you remember at school they would give you like an envelope with all the announcements just put in a piece of paper in the envelope and you take it home yeah. so one of those mm -hmm. i don't know if it was the next week they had open calls for that and they were sending all these open call like uh announcements in people's envelopes and sending the kids home with them so i asked if i could go fluked out and got the lion king and uh as and I, young I like, simba as young simba yeah and i used to Whoa. really like sing man celine dion was my was my like everything like i crushed on her i thought and i just thought she was like the most i still think i still is love that her. is that um there's there has to be something said in regards to celine dion's influence in immigrant households yeah we love her <laughs> oh, where my mom <laughs> celine I think dion my mom loved her. Yeah. Oh, loved her same for you bro yeah yeah <laughs> that's funny <laughs> yeah so i i uh i was i would sing a lot and i so i sang that song at my audition uh, my heart will go on from titanic um did lion king for some time then played hockey like we all have to in ontario or in canada and then uh i would i auditioned for degrassi like I, whatever i i got an agent after lion king but i i never got anything some commercials here and there some psas um, mm. and i didn't care like i would Go to an audition if my mom told me to go and that was it i didn't i enjoyed doing it but i was not like thinking that that was a possibility or like a career choice and i auditioned for degrassi three times and on the fourth time i got a role um these are four separate occasions or these were callbacks no these were this was like hmm. four separate occasions maybe it was three and it was on the third one that i got i can't remember exactly anymore but yeah, I, I went in there a number of times and uh, it was like, you know, the third or fourth time that it worked. I did that and I thought, oh, wow, yeah. you can do this. This can be a career. And I was finishing up. I finished high school that year. And uh, and then I then I realized like, oh, you don't just like get work now. You have to like put work in now to learn how to be an actor. <laughs> <laughs> um so it was a few yeah. years of not working again and and i think it goes in cycles it could it could very well be another few years before you get to work again and you got to go back to the drawing board and figure out how to do this this craft yeah and, uh, but that, see that's what i'm saying with, with like with your story where if some but if someone ever told me like it's not for you like if i were in toronto and and someone told me it's not for me i just go okay i guess that's true and and it, it could squash me where you mm -hmm. heard that and went no i really think i can do this and went up to the other side of the country the second biggest country in the world you yeah. went to the other side of it lived there like i wouldn't have picked up left my family all that stability all that mm -hmm. immigrant household like you stay home you get a good grades you get a job. i think i think for me i was I was really blessed in I had a very solid team around me, um, a team like a support team, which I think is crucial to have in, in this industry. And I think the important part about 
that support team is it has to be an honest team. It wasn't just a team of yes men. So the people that I had around me that were telling me that, no, you're good, you have something, was enough to outweigh my agent telling me that, no, you're not going to make it. Because, no, I, I felt that like to my core when my agent told me that he didn't believe in me because he's the person who's responsible to send me out to auditions and he's not going to send me out if he doesn't believe in me. So it's like the one person who literally has my future in his hands is saying that, no, we're going to send this other person on our roster, which like it killed me. It hurt me. And with that, it was, it was just um, hearing my friends and the support that I had from my friends. And cause it was my friends. um, And then I'll give them credit till the end of time where Jordan Johnson Hines, he was the one like giving me his auditions Yeah. where it's like, I'm helping him with an audition and he's like, Hey, you would be great if you read this, let's yeah. turn it around and put you on. Around, I'll read for you now. Yeah. And because of that, like I still felt busy. If I didn't have him, no, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't have pursued this because I was getting nothing. I was getting no auditions. I wasn't even getting an opportunity for self tapes. And then every time I'd reach out to my agent, He'd be like, look, man, you just got to be patient. We're busy. And I was like, um, Yeah, you guys are busy. What about, I want to be busy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I signed coach. with you guys because you're busy. Like, that's why you're, you're repping me, right? Because so we both can be busy. And so that was like the, the big thing. But no, definitely support system is definitely key in my opinion for that. What was it like for you, especially coming off Degrassi, when you started getting those no's? What was what was keeping you afloat? Oh man, I don't know, man. I made my best friends on that show, like to this day, my best friends. So part of it was like if I were to, I think it might have been two years that I didn't work once I once Degrassi finished. And it was such a like a hit to your ego where you're like, well, but I thought I, I thought I was, I thought I was important. I thought I was a star. You're not. And none of us are. And, uh, and get used to it. And, mm-hmm. and that's okay too. Like it's <laughs> totally fun. Why don't you just get to work, get good and, and, and work on yourself. And, and I didn't want to like lose that group of friends that I was with. So I just stayed with it because these were the people that I was associating with and, and I was, I was still young, so it wasn't like I needed to have anything figured out. I, I suppose if it happened at like 30 and things really took a, a big mm-hmm. dip, then you might have to like look at your life and go, hey, I had a really great time doing this and I have different priorities or whatever. And, and I also don't think that it, there would be any shame in changing career path at this point and going, I really enjoyed that. And I, but I, now I need, I have a family I need to take care of. I need more stability and whatever. Uh, I really like I think that would be absolutely fine too. Um, but yeah, at that time mm-hmm. I was young enough and wanted to still be around these like wonderful, progressive, like forward thinking, funny people. Dalmar, I was it, Paul, yeah. Daddy, these people were funny to me. So I just wanted to be around that. And I stayed by the fire long enough that I got a little piece of yeah. something once in a while. No, that's fair. That's dope though. Now with that, um, in regards to being progressive and doing that and and fueling yourself in a way we're following more into your art where have you had the urge or have you already done it where have you explored directing writing producing any aspect of that yeah um well i went to to ryerson for media production um thinking that hey maybe i'll like try to produce uh, film and TV. Um, and, uh, and Dalmar and I had a, a, uh, a sketch comedy group and I was doing stand up as well. Um, so I, I really liked the process of writing jokes and writing one liners. And I would go for, for like a year, I think I was doing stand up, uh, in like clubs around Toronto, uh, little dingy basement dive bars for like, I, I'd probably do it like four nights a week. Um, and it was a lot of fun. I wasn't all that good, um, but it was fun. I enjoyed writing in that way. Um, and, and, and Dal and I had a sketch 
group and we wrote and, and, and uh, produced some like, you know, little vignettes, comedy vignettes, nothing really happened with it, but it was just like cool to experience, you know, the, the, this kind of circle that we're all a part of this industry in mm. like, different facets to a very lesser degree. Of course, it was like school projects that we were making really for fun. Um, but that's all I've done in the world of like production producing. I've written like a pitch and, and pitched before, but it didn't, it, nothing happened with it. Um, I think I might, I think I will continue to like investigate that and explore that. Um, but you know, that immigrant mentality of like nothing is, you haven't actually done anything or tried your hand at anything unless you have actual success at it. Um, <laughs> so to this point, I haven't experienced yeah. anything like that. So I'm not going to say that I, it's just stuff I've like thought about and dabbled in a little. Why you? Mm -hmm. Have you? Um, I've, I've done it, but not to the degree where I've gotten paid for it. So I'm in that limbo phase of calling myself one, but then like being very shy of calling myself one where I've written a piece and I've, I've performed it on stage with, it was a two hander and I to great acclaim, like a lot of applause and everything again, never got paid for it. So I know that I have something there, sure. but then it's like when even Can you though, take ownership of your own thing that yeah, you made like, and deserve. That yeah, where you where, have to give that to yourself. Yeah, I I'm I also this this is this boils down to me being able to take my own advice because if I was talking to somebody and they were saying that oh I've had things it's like no you're this because you've done so but then it's now it's on me where I don't know how to take my own advice and it's just one of those clusterfucks of things where it's just I don't know how to <laughs> but yeah so it's like I know exactly where. I need to be at mentally, but then it's just, I'm also afraid of admitting that myself. And so I've, I've directed projects where people have seen it and it's like, this is great. I've produced again, but I've just never gotten paid for it. So I think the only thing that can kind of give it some credit to these projects when I've received some kind of congratulations for it is I have an IMDb credit. But then it's like, I also gave myself that IMDb credit <laughs> because it was my what project. You that I put up. <laughs> so it's like, it's, I'll call myself one on the merit that people recognized it and people took the time to reach out to me and say, this was good. And I was like, okay. You can say great. that, but also, also you can call yourself one because you you did it like you did it and that's what it is yeah, right yeah you yeah, are what you yeah, do yeah you, yeah you did it so you, you did yeah. it yeah you can have that you can have that <laughs> tell, tell me more please <laughs> <laughs> no so and i think i think it's it's helpful especially in these in these lulls that you say come where you're not working at the moment where i think i think this has definitely helped keep some sanity in regards to being able to express myself artistically yeah so that and then this concept of creating this podcast is also one of those outlets where it's it's an artistic outlet to discuss the trade and discuss you know other people's methods because there is not there's there's no one method to what I'd label as success as an artist. So I think yeah. hearing everybody's if it were, if it um, were math, also, sorry. If it were math, if it was simple, it was like a formula, I would get good at math real quick. But uh it's not like yeah. that. Yeah. Wait, shouldn't shouldn't you already be good at math? <laughs> you, you would think, but uh to my parents' dismay, no, I'm not <laughs> oh man. So back to talking about like work and stuff yeah. um from if you were if i were to break down your artistic resume from being on stage as simba to going to degrassi to now playing out these meaty roles that you're playing 
what are some things that you've learned from those phases that have stuck with you and what are the differences that you've had to overcome going through each phase because i know there's a huge difference from going from stage to tv and then going from a kids show to an adult show if you will man yeah that's a i've never really thought about that um what i would say is like i always just feel like i want to get back to what i did on lion king when i was 11. like if i could just huh. deliver a performance or that that was like I don't know if it if the word is present or like playful uh on on you know as you get older you get more like anxious or you get more like self like uh conscious about what people are oh. all this other stuff but when I was like doing Lion yeah. King and my dad falls off this I know fake cliff like it's cardboard but like this man who's not my father falls off of this thing and hits the ground and it's slow with like a um a harness and everything but in the in that time i'm 11 years old and they tell me that's my dad and like that's all the ingredients i needed to be like <gasps> and and yeah. believe yeah. it and like run and and feel like <clears throat> sometimes like what happens in that scene is like whatever dad's as you know fossil falls off scar comes and tells him run away what whoa hold on i know spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> mufasa uh, falls <laughs> whoa. and and so then the kid whoever is playing simba runs through the audience up to like the, the entrance of the theater and then they go back around underneath this, the theater and i'd be like so many times i remember like 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 <laughs> like like sloppy snotty crying running up the stairs and uh and it was fun and that was fun doing that even the like you know emotionally difficult stuff or whatever you call it and then you get older and on degrassi like i don't think i was even acting like i was just like playing with friends like i had met these funny kids and i was high school so like you know everybody was so tough in high school but these kids were all funny at set so like it was just fun the entire time i don't think i ever acted and and it shows and then uh <laughs> Uh, you know then you learn like oh i'd like to stay and do this for maybe the rest of my life so you learn all this technical you learn about acting and then i feel like i've been trying to like be a good actor and like mm. it's just so clunky and rigid sometimes i feel or like even even cameras aren't rolling but i just feel so rigid and like awkward with the people you know what I mean? Like I'm not being a person sometimes. Yeah. And there are moments where, you know, you, you find it and it's like, Oh, that's what I was doing at 11. And I have it for a, a, a fraction of a second here. And it's so great. Um, mm. I don't know. I feel like I'm, ch it's like drugs or something where you're chasing that, that first, that first one. And then I, maybe I'm <laughs> over romanticizing. Maybe that's that. a terrible analogy. Cause we're, we're going back to when you were 11. <laughs> yeah yeah oh it's yeah. like it's like drugs doing it unless you were doing drugs when yeah. you were i wasn't that cool really <laughs> so i want to i want to explore more of that because it just sounds so fascinating of an experience where how long was the run how was the rehearsal process do you remember anything during the run in regards to audience reactions what was that all like um yeah like some little anecdotes from lion king really those ones like it doesn't matter how far away in my memory that gets like or in my age that gets that that, that show sticks out to me um like uh like one time me and the girl playing my nala um we like were arguing with each other that was stage. cute that was so cute my nala <laughs> <laughs> Well, there was like two young Simbas, two young Nala's, and like I was always paired with my Nala, and he had his Nala, and um, or he was paired with with a young lady who was his Nala, um, uh, and we were arguing about something, uh, and then there's a scene where where Nala pins Simba, like he tries to fight with her, but like as you know, lionesses are the ones who do the fighting, and uh, they can. So she pins me, and she like pushed me real hard. And I clocked my head off like the 
the stage floor and like <laughs> did the rest of the scene, but I was still, I was kind of crying throughout the scene because um, my head hurt. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that was great. Um, yeah, there's just like, oh, there's one time where, uh, so Bugs kind of like, there's the Hakuna Matata scene where he's going to go eat the bugs with Timon and Pumbaa and he's grossed out by it at first. So these bugs start to come across the stage and like they're just on a piece of cardboard, but behind them is a gear that's like built into the floor and the gear is working and rolling the bug across the stage floor. Um, now the audience can't see that, but I'm behind the puppet. So like I can see it and I don't like, this was not the first show. This was, you know, a good six months into a year long run. Like I knew, and I don't know what happened, but I just like got like zoned out into the gears and forgot, like miscues, didn't hear nothing, just missed it. Uh, uh, and then Timon, or the actor playing Timon, uh, like just saved it with improv. And then I, like, that was the first time in my life that I did improv. Um, because you're, mm. you're on stage, like he's doing this thing, you know you missed a cue and you've got to jump back in. And these aren't the words that we've done for six months. Oh boy, like it's happening for real. And uh, that was, Wow. that's adrenaline at 11 like that's adrenaline that was cool um i feel like that is the character that you want to be caught in that situation with yes like i don't think you'd want to do improv when you're talking to mufasa i think like with timon you have that it's it's his job to, funny, to find man. all these little nuances yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure <laughs> um yeah just yeah, it was a year long run that I did it, that I did it there. And, and probably still goes down as like, I mean, I've had a bunch of best, best things in my life, Degrassi, Lion King. Um, but when I look back, like, you know, it being that first thing for me, it really was like the best thing in my life. Go like going on wow. stage. And, and I grew up in like rural, rural, like Whitby, very white collar, um, conservative, uh, especially back then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, very hockey town, very like, eh, and, and like my first interaction with like, uh, just, just people more like me. Like I told you, my mom mm -hmm. would dunk my Oreos because I didn't want my fingers to get dirty. I didn't exactly fit in in Whitby with those kids. And then there, but there were some who existed that, that were mm -hmm. like, more my 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 vibe um so that was like yeah it was really special for me would you turn your career now and if somebody offered you another role back on stage as your next role how eager would you be to jump on it or would there be some apprehension no i did it i did it to uh... Um, at the beginning of COVID before we came out for MADE. Um, glad to... Hey, Raymond, you still with me? Hello? Sorry about that. Oh, yeah. Did you um, lose me? We might need Sorry. to rehear... Yeah, we did. We might need to rehear that story. So you were oh, saying you, went, you were on stage right before COVID. <laughs> I was just talking, talking away. Oh, uh, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, what was I saying? Uh, oh, yeah, I did, I did a play before... So, play. COVID cut us off um, halfway through the run. And then, okay. but yeah, I would, I, listen, I'll, I'll take any job. I'm glad, I'm glad to work. So if it's theater next, I'll do theater next, gladly. Sure. It's scarier though, yeah. for sure. How do you separate the two? Is there, is there a separate brain that you need to turn on? Because for me, I think there has to be, I need to prepare myself for a theater no matter the role versus for TV. It's like, okay, cool. I got a role and I, I'll, I start in a month easy. Like I'm, I'm ready for that. But then I think for stage, I need to brush up on my, on my projection. I need to brush up on where does it sit for you in regards to preparing for a stage role as opposed to a TV role. I don't think that's, yeah, those things didn't uh, occur to me when I did that. Like I hadn't done theater basically since I was 11 and then I did this theater show two years mm -hmm. ago. So it's been a long time and I didn't think any of those things when I went back. Yeah. I think I was told those things in like rehearsals. They were like, you, you've got to talk a lot louder because um, we can't hear you. 
And meanwhile, I think I'm like screaming in this woman's face, <laughs> but uh, apparently they can't hear me in the back of the room. So I guess maybe they're. That's so funny. Yeah, if I was given something today, maybe I would think have a have a mind toward starting to prepare to perform differently than on camera. But I, I it, it doesn't that stuff doesn't occur to me, and I think other people are there to just tell you, hey, um, yeah, you're, you're missing it. Or, <laughs> <laughs> which play was it is it a known one or did you called, guys write this play yourself no no it was called a belly full um and it, it was at a, a theater aquarius in hamilton um about um hmm. women like coming together to do like a, a belly dancing class in like the basement of this um place and and like discovering rediscovering their bodies and being okay with their bodies in different ways like um and i yeah. i cheat on my wife uh but like belly dancing brings us all back together. It was a comedy. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd assume so. Yeah, it was, belly dancing so doesn't save the day. In did COVID life. cut it off then where like you said you were mid run and then what happened to yeah. it after? Yeah, so it was the very beginning of, it was nine, it was in, well, 2020, um, but January, February, yeah, we were cut off. Uh, March 13th, I was driving to the theater and uh, they emailed us on the drive. So I saw it when I got there and it was like, oh, wow. hey, uh, we're not performing anymore. Like the show is shut down, everything's shut down. Um, Damn. And it was like, it was, that was one of those times when I like, I thought, oh, like maybe I could foresee a career change for myself. I loved like, you know, in theater, you get up every day. We had like notes and stuff. So you'd have to get to the theater whatever rehearsals is you're there, whatever it is, nine to five or whatever that schedule is. But then the actual show run is, is different. You're, if the show's at seven, you're at, you're there at five or something to do notes and do like a little touch-ups on scenes and then grab something to eat and then the show, right? Um, but I really loved, like I, I got up and I, I, I really thought I was some highfalutin something. I rented a car for like the duration of the thing. I don't have a car but I rented a car for the duration of this show and I like I liked like I would I was getting up early I was making bre like bre I was driving to like a job even though the job was theater but like you don't that's not how it is in film and tv it's like you work three days on this movie and someone picks you up and they cart you in you say your lines like a meat puppet and then you leave and you don't know anything <laughs> else you're not involved in any way like like theater, mm -hmm. you, you, it's it's all of us and someone might like email the group and be like hey can we come early i want to try something or whatever i don't know and um yeah I, I liked that i was like i love this i i go to work and i felt like an adult and like a man or whatever um and uh i thought maybe you know if if i if i don't want to continue acting at some point maybe this is fine like i could get another job and i could be happy like i like these moves Mm -hmm. I like these moves and the stability. Yeah. Maybe I just enjoyed it for like a little bit and I would eat those words if I ever decided to put this down. But like for a, for a couple of weeks, that was nice. Yeah, no, I feel that. Like getting into a routine, I think really shocks the body in, in, a, in respect to getting into a rhythm. And I think that's where I think that's just human nature where once your body's in a rhythm, it has some kind of stasis, if you will, where yeah, it can exist that. at this level. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, I agree. I agree. Because especially when I was doing my theater run too, it felt very, it felt normal in a sense where not normal in the aspect of this is life but normal in the aspect of my body is okay with this but at the same time i feel like i could also be proud to tell my parents that i'm doing something right now i'm going to work and like <laughs> that also balances things out because waiting around just for film and tv auditions also has that redundancy of just looking like you're doing nothing and I think that was a big thing too with my parents is they just saw me doing nothing but it's like I'm, I'm waiting I'm reading I'm, I'm trying to 
you know, just keep yeah. my mind focused. I'm doing something. It's just doesn't, yeah. this isn't just nothing, but then actually it going to look like it. Everything. Yeah. So I think yeah. that's, that's the fun part about finding a nice rhythm as well. Yeah. I think so much of like this, like, I think I'm not the only one who, I don't, I only know how to equate it to like, to, to hockey or to athletics where, um, the, the phrase is like squeeze the stick too hard, like in hockey, where like you, you want a goal so bad, so you, but you're squeezing too hard and you're trying too hard. And it's, and it's like, how do you not try that hard when you're just waiting? You're just waiting and hopeful. And um, then your opportunity comes along and it feels like this is the, this is the one, this is the only chance. This is my chance. And how are you going to mm-hmm. be your best in this thing where you're supposed to be natural or, yeah like they're asking really something pretty simple of you and you can't do it it's like the most it's like a such a an oxymoron feeling all confused and i don't think i'm the only one and and what i think oh where i'm going with this is what i think would help like everybody is if you have something else like to stabilize like or balance your life with like if you know if you're economically and, and like, you know, in your mind also fulfilled by other things too, then like the way I was when I was a kid, when doing Lion King, then Degrassi came and I just had fun. And I, and like I said, I wasn't acting, I was just playing. Um, and, and I was like really, truly very happy. Um, but then, you know, life makes, it makes all these demands of you and those demands are economic. Those demands are, so whatever they are and if you find other ways to fulfill them then you can just keep doing this as like a, a a hobby and then i bet like weirdly the success rate that you're looking for or whatever that everybody's looking for like jumps because all the pressure's off and you can just do this thing that they're asking of you so easily yeah yeah no i i wholeheartedly agree with that sentiment where I think especially, I think the key word here is success because as a child, you don't have that same heavy definition of success that we associate with adulthood success. So when you go to work as an 11 year old, all you, you think is, I just need to be present. I just need to remember my, I just need to not get distracted by gears. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, that's, that's a good day where yeah. I think, I think the big thing that pressure that sits on my shoulder, especially when I get to set is, man, it would suck to lose this job because I have bills to pay. <laughs> yeah. I think that's like the forefront of my mind when I'm, when I'm working now as I'm getting older, it doesn't matter what job. Cause I, I even remember back when I was still working at an accounting firm, um, and still trying to audition where my boss called me into the office. And as like, I'll, I'll, I'll say to anybody at the time where it's like, Oh no, fuck this job. Cause I want to act. I know I'm an actor and I don't need this. But then when my boss called me into the office and was like, your work is suffering, man. We're going to have to let you go. Like, I was like, shit, no, I need this. I, I can't, I, how am I going to well, give me one month that? while I prepare? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think even back to um, what you were mentioning too, in regards to being able to play and going back to that feeling of how you were when you were on Lion King where whenever I I think of that, I always, the first thought that jumps in my head is children's acting schools where people want to have kids classes for actors. And in my mind, I'm like, no, I think that, I think that's the last thing that kids need if they want to be an actor is a class because a kid doesn't need to, know how to play a kid's imagination is already ready to go and i think 
in regards to adult classes, I think the adult classes should be a reminder of what it means to be a kid because yeah. all these all these walls and filters of how we see the world and how we perceive the world supposed to be stop us from playing and stop our imagination from working where it's like as a kid, okay, this is your dad and he's falling from a cliff and that's all you need where now it's like, okay, this is your dad. He's falling from a cliff. Oh, I don't like How that. How close am I though. with him? R- right. Am I, am I supposed to, you know, and now you're asking all these questions where it's like, he's, it's as simple as just, he's your dad and he's falling. Where's, and just, get, listen, where's the, maybe there is value in all that extra work as that, as an adult, you can do to like enrich the performance so much. But yeah, you're so right. Like, really what it is, is pretty simple instructions that like, whether it's a director or a writer, someone's just telling you like, hey, this is the story, believe it and go do it. Like, it's really pretty simple, but it's so hard. Yeah. And so, so hard. You phrase it, you phrase it in, in a very simple way too, where it's like, everything's an oxymoron with us. <laughs> where I hate when people, you know, ask me, how do I do this? Where it's like, oh, how do you cry? Or how do you pretend to hate somebody on, on stage? Or it's like, where it's, it's there's, there's really no how to it. It's, do you hate somebody? Yes, great, go, you hate the person. And it's like, our job is so simple, but it's so hard because of all the filters and our perception of how we go about life now and how we're, we're raised and how we're, we're subjected to whatever is out in the world that seems normal. So, yeah, no, not too sure where I'm going with this, other than the fact that kids That's where it, like, that's where you are, play. like, yeah, I get what you're saying. And I agree so yeah. wholeheartedly, and I don't know that, I mean, classes, I'm sure, are beneficial because um, they, are, they are grounds for trying stuff where, like, I guess it's true. Like, as we get older, it's, like, more frowned upon. You can't really – you can't do kid stuff, like, behave like a child when you're an adult. It's just not feasible. Um, and I guess class – Why, kids, though? Why? Yeah, I, that's – that's. I, I, uh. You're right. You're right. Why? Why not? Um, yeah. But – if whatever it is, if you got to pay a hundred dollars to go to this room where there is now permission for adults to, to try and behave like children, fine, call it a class, call it whatever you want. Really, it's just a space where we're allowed to go and attempt to be human again. Um, yeah. So I think probably, probably there's value in that just because like the system and everything and reality is set up such that like we have to be like this, be like how we are. Um, and really we should try to break out of it like the way you are so yeah. radically with this thing yo question um how do you i'm sure you're getting self tapes and stuff as all of us are because mm-hmm. there's no there's no inversion auditions anymore um yeah how, are you doing them are you doing them in the truck yeah yep um just put up a a blank sheet to so it's funny too cuz like for me i'm i'm not a fan of of needing the the blank wall where whenever I've done my self tapes, I'll, I'll, this would be my background. Right. Where, because everything is, is a lot more cluttered here. Now I'm kind of like, okay, I need the blank wall to just kind of stop distracting from the tape. So we, we just put up the, the, like a bed sheet there. And then on this side of here, like this is where I'll put the camera, face it in this way. And yeah, it looks it looks like I'm I'm in a room doing it. So like yeah, yeah. You don't out. need all that much space. You just need a clean like plate to look at there. Yeah, if if I was also sitting down, then like with that like this, I I'd, I'd just crop it out more, sit lower, fake it out, right. and then this would be my my frame <laughs> where. I don't know. Because I did a self tape um, when I was in Hawaii, but I was camping, so we did it in the tent. Luckily, oh. I didn't have to stand for it, where I could sit 
and then you have like the tent, the the what's the, the fabric like, called? The, I'm, uh, the tarp like fabric, like that yeah. was my background, and I think yeah, with that it's just like. I've been I've been lucky enough to put myself in that mindset of not needing lights, not needing the the microphone, not needing all of that jazz when I had my place mm-hmm. and I got used to it. So that mindset has kind of allowed me the freedom to tape the way that I do now. Um because I know for a fact if I were to do this for other people they'd be like um i i need this i need this i could get so it works for you, but to each their own with it and are you not getting any kind of like, yeah uh, flack from management or agent or anything about no nope. um luckily with the team that i have they they they're just looking at the acting versus whatever else is going on and granted i'm not i don't have too much happening in the background to distract them with it where I'm also at least trying to do my due diligence with that. Yeah, of course. So, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, and it's all working out. So how, but I mean, obviously COVID has interrupted what your initial plans for this trip was going to be, but like how long and and what have the changes been? Like, what are, what are you, how long are you going to do this? And um, it could be forever. It could be forever. And like, I, I think. Yeah, it, it could down. be. It could be. But um, COVID hasn't really interrupted what i wanted to do um because the plan was to just get somewhere warm um and and get away from the canadian winter that was that was the plan so i'm still doing that um even though there's still covid and stuff um this lifestyle also allows us to what do you call it to distance from people yeah. Right. So being in here, everything's in here. Um, if we have to go out, we're at a grocery store and we're masked up when we go, which would be the same thing if, if I was just stuck in a city at a place. There is something really depressing about living in like a. Yeah, there's just something depressing about living in a box that was layered with other boxes, with other people living in it. And I was like, I, I just, as, as nice as my place is, as much as I enjoy having all of what I've cultivated, I have my mini gym layout, I have my little garden on my balcony, like, as much as I love this, I feel trapped. Yeah. And so, this opportunity, as long as the engine starts, <laughs> I feel like I can, I can go anywhere, I can, I can wake up with any view that I want and there's just there's just something freeing about that the only thing that I'm scared of now is when we do head back to Canada are the borders going to be closed for us when I try to get back down again next year why would they be closed for you next year if for whatever reason they think that closing the border is going to stop um, or prevent COVID from spreading more because it, it did last year. Um, when I was building the truck, the borders were closed. And then let's say the timeline was I was going to have the truck finished in June, but the borders were going to be closed until July. And then July came and then they pushed the date. Okay, the borders are going to be closed until September. And then September came and then they pushed the date again where the, so yeah. that's actually what prompted the move or the drive um, South. eastbound first oh, where, oh, okay, okay, it's September. They say that they're going to open the borders in October. Okay, great. So we're going to go east and then we're going to go south once the borders open in October. And then we went east, October came, and then they're like, oh, borders are going to be closed until November okay now we're east i guess we'll just stay here and hope for the best and luckily the borders did open up because i would dread having to have had this in canada with the border closed because the water the water system would all freeze up (laughs) what is that in new brunswick yeah being in new brunswick in january february yeah yeah that's gonna be tough so 
but I think whatever. Hours. I think you know the border thing will. We we may experience that again, but it'll it'll all, always only be temporary, right? Yeah. Well, with that temporary, that temporary can happen long enough to freeze up my entire plumbing system. So that's where my head's at when it comes to that. Um, but other than that, where it's like, as long as the weather is above five degrees, this is Celsius, mind you, not Fahrenheit, but as long as it's above five degrees, like it's, it's livable. Yeah. Um, but ideally we'd want it to be warmer than that, which is why we're in San Diego. Yeah. So have you met like, <laughs> forgive me for like thinking that your life is like nomad land, but have you met like cool, like communities that are doing the same similar thing? Yeah. Um, this is essentially nomad land. Um, if I had to say, and where I am, more on the luxurious side of it because so like one big thing that I've that I kind of came to resent in a way is the hashtag van life um because for lack of a better word it's gentrified what this community really is majority of people that are in these communities are escaping you know evictions and stuff like that mm -hmm. where it's not a glamorized community right. and the people that i've met great people especially when i was building it i found a place in vancouver um that was near a home depot and there was like a an rv community next to it where on one side of the street you had people that were trying to just live there quietly and peacefully out of their vans. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, you had people shooting up drugs and stuff and completely, you know, disrespecting the property and, and leaving their garbage and pissing and all that stuff. So there were times where like law enforcement would come and they'd essentially evict the vehicles that were on all the, just one, the strip one painted with one brush right so luckily there was that much of a visual difference where the side that we were on was clean there was no garbage and the other side like you had shopping carts and and you know tents that were broken up on the side so there was there was a real contrast which you know helped law enforcement see it's like okay you guys aren't the problem they are we're going to focus on that but we still have to put this you know not a ticket but we have to put this sign this eviction sign on your windshield in the meantime to say we did our job but we're not going to evict you guys right, right 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 so me seeing that i'm not living in my truck yet i'm just building it there yeah so i'm not too stressed about it but then it's like you have all of these other people who are living there mm -hmm. and it's such a opportune um location a prime location because you have the home depot there you can get water there um you have a grocery store that's not too far so the location is is prime real estate if you will for this nomad life and but no yeah i've definitely met some cool people i've also met some interesting characters which um <laughs> to say the least is like i think it, it comes with this kind of lifestyle if you're doing this kind of lifestyle you have there's a bit of crazy somewhere and i definitely also have to own that there's some bit of crazy up here which is why i'm doing this yeah um but then there's this one character lived in his rv but he also had aspirations to be a writer a script writer and so through the talk on the neighborhood like the person living right next to my truck was like oh you should get me to see your writing because i'm on tv and i know the industry 
And then I was like, sure. I'll give you, I'll give you 10 pages. Give me, (laughs) I'm here. Uh, Give me 10 pages. Let's see what you got. And this guy seemed so nice. And I'm reading a script and I was like, oh, you're old school white where you think it's okay to write like this. All right, we got to talk. <laughs> oh, boy. Where we, yeah, where I was like, uh, yes. The, the thing, the one thing that I remember is in his descriptions of a character that he introduced. Um, and I think he, he named her Busty Woman. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, all that's right, so holding, we got to talk about, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we're not even, we're not even 10 pages into this 40 pages that you so graciously wrote, but busty woman, not going to fly. And, oh, and there's this, there's another part where, um, he tried to get a little culture in there. And so he's like, how, be terrible. <laughs> where. He's like how the two cops walk into a, a Jamaican restaurant and they order a roti and I was like, hold on, time. And then like he even he even wrote like the the dialogue in like a patois slang, if you will. Okay. I was like, okay, so first of all, you don't really need to write in this dialect. I think if you just say that you're going to have a Jamaican, you know, store great let's do that and to order a roti cool but how about they order jerk chicken because (laughs) it doesn't matter i'm not ordering roti just dry roti roti (laughs) (laughs) it was a chicken roti apparently but still he's at a jamaican restaurant and i was like all right these are two culturally different things we you need to pick one for us whichever way we're gonna go so it's like it was it was a great ten pages what, what of entertainment. You, what were that's you gonna sure. do? Forgive me, but what were you as an actor gonna do with this man's script? Like you're gonna get it, mate. Like what are you gonna do? Someone could give me. He a just wanted critique. Like, he just. Great. <laughs> I like it. I don't. Yeah, know that was the thing. Want. He he wanted he wanted critique, and which which I was more than happy to give him ten pages worth of my time, which surprisingly amounted to a lot of notes over the just the ten pages. <laughs> but like, yeah definitely met a lot of characters which was which was interesting and it's it's just a yeah it's a it's a fun community when you just kind of take it for what it is where you yeah you're just you're you definitely have to be empathetic in this type of situation where minding minding what you say to in regards of of money and where i got into an argument with one of my yeah like i didn't i didn't these are these are the people that you should help and you'll need help at some point and you'll right yeah so like that was that was the thing too that i had to learn was like not that i had to learn but i had to i had to put into practice where i can't joke around in regards to being frivolous and stuff like that. And even when it came to food, where not letting food go to waste was already a thing in my head. But then like, even in regards to now being mindful of just how much I cook, um, just because there should be no reason to be gluttonous in in a lifestyle like this. It doesn't make any sense. Could I do it? Sure, but what's what's the purpose of it? What's the means of it? And then back to my my motto, if you will, my hakuna matata, being um, yeah, getting back to my needs versus my wants. Where it's like, what does my body need? Understanding that this is all I need to live. I don't need all this frivolity to live and seeing how other people are living like right next to me gives me reason to put more effort into something else rather than just doing nothing and ordering you know fast food for the sake of whatever yeah 
So yeah, man, it's so cool. Like it's so back cool. to your question. Yeah, I've met I've met people. <laughs> what about your? Uh, I don't like. Again, your immigrant thing. Your immigrant. You come from that. Uh, what is your family? How's their response been to this? It's it's a reluctant support. Yeah. Where my lifestyle has kind of all. Even wanting to pursue acting was its own wild idea that <laughs> they only recently like started to understand what goes into it and what kind of time that takes to go into it. So then for me to do something as crazy as this, that it seems, um, they kind of, they, I had to show them that I had like amenities. It's like, I have a kitchen. I have, I have food. It's okay. You don't have to worry about that. I have, I have water. You don't have to worry about that. I have a bathroom. You don't have to worry about that. And so right, right. having to reassure like, them. Cause like yeah, my mom, something. my mom looked at it and it's like, we didn't come to Canada just for you to live in a truck. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> it's like, okay, right, it's not, right, it's not right, that absolutely. bad. Right. So, and then even going to Toronto and then, them being able to come inside and see inside and then my nephew and my godson also looked inside and were like, wow, this is so cool. And so <laughs> it, it felt like their amazement was also a cosign that this was a oh, decent right. like thing. Oh, he's just being a big kid. Okay, fine. We'll let him do it. So, but then my mom checks up on me every now and then and yeah, sure they're, they're I still contribute. <laughs> about you all the oh, time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, I can imagine. So, I can imagine my mom would be, would be on me about stuff all the time. <laughs> but this is like the cool, no. like, man. What you're doing is so, and it's not even unlike you. Like you've done this. You've done a move like this that's like so renegade before. Like because you felt, yeah. because you felt for a second that you can do it, so you went to Vancouver. You felt like you can do it, so you are doing this thing right now. Like I feel like so many people sit on their hands about something they felt, and they don't like are not doing. Like what you're doing is not common. I don't think, not just the the van thing, mm. not just this this lifestyle, but the spring to action thing. I don't mm. think people. I think people sit I on think... their hands about stuff. Yeah, no, and then with respect to that phrase too, that spring to action, I think that's what separates, you know, us as artists and us as individuals who want to pursue something where everybody wants it, but the only difference is you have people that want it and are willing to do it versus the people that just say they want it. And I find that very reflective of just the society in regards to what people think they're capable of. And I wish more people believed in themselves more and, and thought that they also had the means to do what they conceive in their minds because they can. I don't, I don't think your mind would put you in a situation just to tell you that you can't do it because that's just the body going against itself, in my opinion, where I think your mind is only going to tell you what you can do. Well, I don't know, man. I, I hope I hope that I am uh, in my life pursuing things like 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 pursuing the things that I claim to want as like sincerely as you are about about the things you're claiming that you. You know what I mean? Hmm. You are. You, you are. You 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 want to get back to the stage. You want to get back to I'm your eleven year old self. You're good. <laughs> yeah. We're we're inspired both ways. It's it's a mutual inspiration. And for me personally, I also got to say, like, I'm I'm super grateful and thankful to have crossed paths with you and and to have become friends with you because your your journey within the acting industry is is. It's admirable to say the least, because in my opinion too, breaking out from child actor to what we consider an adult actor, I think is 
a testament to what somebody's passion is in the industry because there's so many kids that come in the industry and they do their one two projects and they say they don't want it anymore which is honestly, more power honestly, to them fair to them power to you yeah power to you because it is a tough it is a t- if like if you don't want to do it anymore i respect that uh because you can if you can be happy and make money in way easier ways than what we're choosing to do um but i just happen yeah. to enjoy this thing and i'm will i'm willing to take some losses or whatever um mm-hmm. or the but that what that's what it's all about in regards to just enjoying it do what you enjoy that's life that should be what everybody's objective should be yeah 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 but raymond we need to pick this back up another time because i definitely want to pick your brain more about the industry too and in regards to the topic of diversity and your thoughts on that because we've 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 talked about that as well but just to get it officially and stuff but we've been chatting for a while now and i gotta say i'm so grateful for your time i didn't feel like Uh, (laughs) like anything it was great i know thank you so much and i i can't wait to to follow up and and catch up with you again and i can't wait to hear what's next for you as well same because i'm i'm wishing wishing the best and wishing all the greatest for for what's to come for you thank you man same for you um we can do but everybody you. thank you all for tuning in to the two oh you're still you're still talking right no, come on we gotta, uh, I'll that up. my bad i'm out everybody thank y'all for coming out to the two degrees podcast brought to you by the play on foundation raymond the black check him out and all that he's doing Ginny and georgia filming for season two and i gotta say i was i was thrilled for season one and and the development that went through all of that And for whatever next to come, I wish you all the best, buddy. Other than that, everybody stay safe.